No part of the following lecture material may be used without the express written consent of Rick Ramos or Contra Costa College. Hi, this is Professor Rick Ramos, and we are teaching the Address 221 lecture series. Today's lecture, which is Lecture 5, is on material objects. So what are material objects? They're real evidence and demonstrative evidence, which include physical objects presented as evidence. So demonstrative, what I mean by that is it demonstrates something. So if you were to show me a chart, if you were showing me a map or a photograph that showed me landscaping where a body was found in a backyard and it would help me to understand that, that would demonstrate it. It would be just demonstrative. Material objects usually carry a high credibility with the trier of fact, meaning the judge, and they believe what they see. When properly recognized, collected, recorded, preserved, and analyzed, material objects usually speak for themselves, where witness testimony may be impeachable because of someone's distance from the area, prejudice, or, or physical capabilities like bad eyesight. When we speak about physical evidence, what we mean is physical things presented to the trier of fact for proof purposes in court. Now, the first thing that we have to know about is what's called the... Um, theory of transfer. And what that, that means is that when two objects meet, some effect of that meeting can be established at a later time. In other words, when a perpetrator comes into a crime scene, anybody that commits a crime, they bring something with them and leave it, and they take something with them off of the crime scene. And that's what the theory is. Examples could include commercial burglar leaves fingerprints on a cash box, or someone leaves a footprint that is very unique uh, style of wear of a shoe where maybe the heels worn a certain way and we're able to show later on that that's their particular shoe. A hot prowl rapist leaves semen evidence and hair evidence on bed sheets and takes away the victim's pubic hair on his groin area after the act of sexual penetration and we're able to show that medically, scientifically. We collect it medically into evidence and we show it scientifically. In a felony hit-and-run case, vehicle paint is transferred. Clothing and pieces of car headlight are left on the roadway. And a blood stain or fiber evidence from the, the pedestrian's clothing are transferred to the vehicle bumper. And so there's a variety of things that could meet that standard. When we talk about real evidence, one of the um, terms the off author uses in explaining to you um, real evidence is categories. And he uses the term FICE, F-I-C-E, as an acronym for remembering four different separate categories of evidence. And those categories are fruits of the crime, which is property taken during the crime, or the loot, instrumentality of the crime, which is some physical item the suspect holds onto or uses to commit the crime, like a knife or a crowbar or a mask or... Um, tape to tie up the, the victims, anything that you use to commit the crime. C is contraband, and it's items that are illegal for a person to possess, possess like controlled substances or um, weapons or things that are found as a result of your investigation that weren't originally part of the investigation or part of the original crime. And last is physical evidence, which includes trace evidence, perishable evidence, types of scientific evidence, including biological evidence, blood, semen, saliva, Blood splatter um, evidence, ballistic evidence, hair, fibers, fingerprints, palm prints, tool marks, and then fragmentary evidence including metal, glass, paint, soil, and wood debris. If you look in your uh, lecture notes for this chapter on page 2, that PDF, you'll see I give you some uh, examples of real evidence and there's also a article on DNA evidence, which we'll talk about in a minute. One of the things that you have to realize, if there's some new scientific method that law enforcement is going to use to identify perpetrators of cases, that scientific method must be accepted by the general scientific community. DNA was just not originally accepted. There had to go, they had to go through some studies, some empirical studies, especially in the area of doing the calculations of the ratios of probability as to the fact that a certain person's blood would be, um, it'd be impossible for it to be someone else's DNA match other than the perpetrator in the case. 
So there's some, there's some information that you can read about that uh, in the book under Kelly Fry, and you can also look at the uh, article on page two regarding the Texas man who was released, at, released after 15 years in prison. When evidence is found, we have to start what we call a chain of possession or custody chain of evidence. We have to also authenticate the evidence, meaning that the person responsible for the collection of the evidence or the finder must be identified in circumstances under which the evidence is re recovered are documented, including the time collected and the location. And usually the identifier will put some sort of a mark on the evidence. It has to be something that doesn't destroy the probative value of the evidence or destroy the ability to match the evidence to the suspect later. But if you found a gun in a part of the gun that was not really necessary to be tested, you might scratch your initials. But you need to basically say where you found it, what date and time you found it, and who found it. Retired San Francisco Giants baseball star Barry Bonds has recently been the subject of media stories and also general knowledge that he is being indicted for perjury. One of the key pieces of evidence in the case, which is a report and a lab test, have both been found to be inadmissible in court because there was no chain of evidence when this evidence was collected. It's necessary to maintain a record of the persons who handle the evidence from the point of collection to the time it's presented in court to maintain its integrity. In the Bonds case, the judge felt that there was no valid chain of evidence, so you couldn't tell who the heck had been in charge of these documents. And so, therefore, they were excluded. The purpose of maintaining the chain of evidence is so that it puts a burden on the party offering the evidence to show to the satisfaction of the trial court that all the circumstances into accounting, including the ease or difficulty with which particular evidence could be altered, that it's reasonably certain there was no alteration. And that comes from People versus Williams, a number of different courts ranging all the way back to 1956, but the latest court cases in 1992. But the bottom line is, is that failure to properly authenticate and maintain the chain of evidence of material objects can result in the admissibility of the evidence or cause it to be impeached in court. What duties to collect or preserve evidence do the police have? That's a good question, and the law prescribes that there is no legal duty for police to collect evidence. The fact that police don't collect or overlook a piece of evidence at a crime scene is not in itself a due process violation. Some examples include police have no legal duty to collect blood stains, articles either due to inadvertence or belief that there was not enough blood for sample analysis. Due process doesn't require the police to employ specific investigative techniques or other affirmative collection efforts, and this is People versus Brady. In Lavarillo, there's no legal obligation to lift or preserve fingerprints from a weapon involved in a crime. In, in Michael L., means it's a juvenile case in 85, there's no su suppression of witness identification evidence because the police failed to collect a surveillance videotape of the robbery. And there are a few other examples that you can look at in the chapter. The next question is, do the police have a duty to, to preserve evidence? Well, this is a split decision unless it, it fits the Trumpetta standard, which we'll talk about in a second. The answer is no. Uh, there's no constitutional grounds for case dismissal unless the defendant can show that the evidence was destroyed in bad faith. And there's a couple of cases you can look at. The one is about the 10-year-old kid in Arizona. Um, there's one failure to preserve semen evidence and loss of photograph of lineup was not a denial of due process. The mere loss of the evidence or failure to perform certain tests on the evidence itself is not bad faith. That's Goldsmith in 89. Loss, loss of witness tapes involved. No Sixth Amendment violation. While prior recorded testimony may be impeachment value, the state has no constitutional obligation to maintain such records. A witness can still personally testify. So there's a couple you can look at. Now, the one that's of interest to me is if the defendant argues that the police destroyed evidence in bad faith, 
there is an additional defense burden to show such destruction equates to due process violation. And this is called the Trumpetta decision. And here's how these are the, the, uh, the protocol for this. Number one, the evidence possessed exculpatory value, meaning it tended to show that the suspect was guiltless or blameless in the instant crime charge. The second rule is the evidence is of such a nature that the defendant would be unable to obtain comparable evidence by any other reasonable means. And examples include the Trombetta case, which actually says that there's no need to retain a separate breath sample for future defense analysis of an intoxilizer test in a DOI case because the sample wouldn't necessarily be exculpatory. Sample could show the defendant was under the influence of alcohol. But in Trompetta, one of those things is you have to be given uh, the other option. If the person does not wants to be able to recheck their evidence, then they would request a blood or urinalysis because they would have additional blood and urine to retest at a later time. Another example, a negligent loss of a knife by the police didn't justify dismissal of a assault with a deadly weapon charge. Although the knife was crucial to the case, it didn't have the apparent exculpatory value and is no, no showing that the police intentionally destroyed the knife. In other words, we can establish that it was assault with a deadly weapon by examining the wound. If you see, you can tell what type of weapon is used. If it's real jagged, it's usually some sort of a blunt object like a, a hammer or something that's thrust in the body. If it's real clean, a very clean cut, it's by some sort of edge weapon. In People v. Fry in 98, which was a death penalty case, the police overlooked a number of things, including shotgun casings and failure to collect a slipper that had some blood on it and test some other blood articles. And the court ruled that there was no due process violation because even though they didn't do that, none of this evidence would have been exculpatory in nature. Please review the chapter for additional information on this topic. Although it's a little out of sequence in the notes, I've already spoken about dem demonstrative evidence and what it's used for. So you can go back earlier in this lecture and you'll be able to hear that information. We're going to move on now and talk about physical evidence in the Fifth Amendment. Now remember, the Fifth Amendment only applies to testimonial evidence. In other words, you it's what comes out of your mouth. If someone goes out and they um, say something that shows some sort of guilt and you violated their, their rights per the Fifth Amendment, then you can't go on the stand and repeat it. There is no Fifth Amendment privilege to refuse to provide physical evidence, such as fingerprints, blood, hair, photograph exemplars, to participate in lineups or show ups or provide chemical tests. And this is because it's non testimonial in nature. It doesn't force the suspect to speak out against themselves. Hence, no Fifth Amendment violation. As a matter of fact, in some cases, failure to provide chemical tests or participate in an identification test like handwriting exemplar or voice exemplar or performance test is admissible as consciousness of guilt, where you'll be able to state that the reason they didn't participate is they knew they were guilty. So as you can tell by now, this is an important process, is gathering of evidence. Experience and professional training tells us that officers should attempt to collect all possible evidence at the crime scene. Sometimes, though, this is referred to as the overgathering process. Relevant evidence could be inculpatory at trial and prove, or to prove guilt or could be exculpatory and exonerate the defendant. Defense counsel will attempt to argue that the failure to collect certain types of evidence as an impeachment of the investigative team. Prosecutors commonly confront what is termed as a CSI syndrome because you know, when you watch a TV, they come up with some exotic evidence and they convict a the person uh, in about an hour. And that's not real life. That's not what really happens. Lay jurors have the impression that because of this television show, that there's always crime scene evidence that can be collected and interpreted. Defense counsels will also contend if officers conduct a careless investigation, which is contrary to standard police practice, that... Um, the whole case should be thrown out. And a number of cases, if you, if you do a bad job, it's going to throw doubt on your case and could lead to the uh, release of the defendant. The failure to collect the evidence could lead to reasonable doubt in the mind of one of the triers of fact and there goes your case. So this is a really important topic for you to learn and know about and for you to develop good standards of practice. That's the end of this lecture. Make sure you check your study questions. 
make sure you check the homework assignments and quizzes as they're related to this chapter and this module. This is Professor Rick Ramos and have a great day.